The biggest story of the day uh, and really started to um, permeate around LSU football supporters and people and message boards and news outlets yesterday afternoon is the devastating news as our uh, as, as our guy Wilson Alexander had at first uh, said that John Emery has suffered a torn ACL and that was announced during Tuesday's practice and will miss the rest of the season. Uh, Emery had made his recovery back to the field after tearing his ACL versus Florida last November. I mean, late in the season, Emory sustained this injury and to see the way that they were pushing him early in fall camp, a lot of people around the, the media and covering the program were like, man, this is pretty intense what they got Emory going through. And obviously they were trying to get him ready for the season. He was the leading rusher in the game on Sunday night as he had 61 rushing yards on 10 carries versus USC. He was uh, looking as if he was going to be um, the, the the premier back on this team, at least for the first part of the season. And the news hit yesterday that he was going to be out for the year. And it seems like in following the, the, the messages on social media, the outpouring on social media, everybody, a lot of you were hit just like I know our show was as we had an internal text thread happening. Um, and I know for me personally – once I read the news, I mean, I was crushed. Crushed. I mean, just almost brought down to your knees, man, for, for John Emery, of just what he's gone through. I know a lot of it has been brought on by himself, but also in the, in the, the, the silver lining of the story, a lot of it had, had started to really work out. The graduation, getting back on the field— getting back healthy, and really looking as if he was going to use this sixth year as, as the, the year that he was going to get on the field and, and really contribute from start to finish. And it just it didn't work out. Uh, they announced the injury yesterday. It happened earlier this week. And there's no way to spin it. There's no way other than it's just devastating news, both personally for John Emery and collectively – for LSU's football team. I, 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 you know, for as much as we all love Emory, thinking about him, talking about, you know, the, 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 the thoughts, the prayers, the, the feelings that we have for, for John Emory, um, you know, one thing that, that, that I have not heard a lot being discussed is this is crushing to the, to the team. Hey, this is, the, 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 the reason why there was so much emphasis on getting Emory ready to go for the season is because Kelly, Frank Wilson, Joe Sloan, Cortez, Hank, and the offensive crew for LSU believe wholeheartedly, and these guys have the experience and understanding of you got to have multiple backs in the SEC to make it wire to wire. You got to have guys that you can trust. And the Trey Holly situation really kind of threw them into a, a little bit of disarray once it was, it was pushed back. There was not going to be a ruling on it for, for some time. And how were they going to get that, that other guy? And Emory was, he was the one. He was the one that they were going to bring up to speed. They, they were going to get him healthy. They were going to get him right. And they were going get, to get him on the field, obviously, after what we saw on Tuesday, on, on Sunday night. And, you know, to have the announcement come out on Wednesday that he would be missing the remainder of the season, it's, it's bone-crushing for, for him personally. And, you know, I think we all understand that, that, you know, we, we all pull for Emory. He's a great dude. He's got a great personality. He's a New Orleans kid. You know, he's a Louisiana's own, one of the best running backs from a high school standpoint to come out over the last 10 to 15 years. And while he's had shades of, of success at LSU, it's never been that consistent run, literally, you know, no, no, no pun in it, but just that he's able to stay healthy from start to finish and, and enjoy how good of a football player he is at the college level. And to have that taken away, an injury this week, 
man, I just I feel for him. I hate that for for everybody involved. I know that there's a lot of people internally at LSU that are, you know, I mean, you, you think you're crushed or we're crushed. Those guys that, and people that are around Emory every single day, been a part of his rehab, been right there with him and watching him put in the work and try and get back in on the field. Man, it's just, it, it, it's a tough day for that. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's a, it's a devastating story. It really is. There's no way to, there's no way to, to, to spin it really. When you talk about what it means, um, obviously the personality of Emory and, and, and him not having the opportunity to finish out his final season at LSU and, and, and having to deal with injury on it, it just, it sucks. It, there's, there's no other way to, 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 to really forecast it. Yeah. I mean, especially with the way that Sunday night went for him you know of course you, it did you saw him get on the field and when you when he kind of buzzed off that long run it was just kind of a, this beautiful moment for all LSU fans because you know we've LSU fans have been there watching him throughout these six years and kind of have felt some of the pain and, and been through it and you saw him finally kind of make the plays you've been waiting on in a game of that magnitude and then for him to be the best Running back on the field, and then to get that news on Tuesday. I mean, I mean, yesterday it was just absolutely heartbreaking. I'll be interesting to hear what what the not the fallout is, but just you know, kind of the pushback, the, just the description of what what you know what happened. Because right. I know when I, when I saw him at first, I was like, "Is that John Emery out there? Is that forty? Is forty four John Emery?" Mm-hmm. And then when somebody was like, "Yeah," I was like. Damn, that's quick. I mean, like November is. I mean, that's when you're talking about early August in fall camp and seeing the 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 pressure he was putting on that knee and going through full contact, and then you know, I mean, so much so that Kelly had to really kind of explain it of what the purpose was. Why are you doing this? Why are you pushing him so soon? off of this knee injury and, and and like he explained it they need the guy they need the back they need the player they need him to be ready and it was obvious now after watching LSU play for a game that and, and you know I mean I just mean this from a football standpoint they don't really trust Caleb Jackson Josh Williams to be the guy I mean if they did Sunday night would have been it Right? I mean, they wanted to to feature Emory. They wanted to get him the ball. He was the most effective guy. And that that's where LSU's running back room was leaving game one. <laughs> you know, I mean, I know our story here Monday morning was one of the top storylines that we talked about in doing our show in Vegas is that John Emory is running back one. <laughs> like, forget the discussion. Forget the competition. Don't overthink it. Feed him. I mean, if that's what he's going to be and just thinking, look, he'll progressively just kind of improve, get healthy, his confidence will build, all of it. And by the time you get to October, maybe he's got all those uh, those cobwebs of, you know, missing time and the, the, the mental hurdle that you have to jump and getting back after an injury like a knee for a running back will, will be resolved. Um, and, you know, it just... Sucks, man. It's a it's a it's a it's a devastating story, really. When you talk about um, just the player, and you know, I mean, what he is. I, I you know, the first the, the first thing I thought of when when it hit was, I don't know what John Emery wants to do in 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 his life. I don't know what he aspires to be once he he leaves college um, outside of football. I'm sure that his his lifelong goals was to make it to the NFL. And, and and play at the highest level. And at points during his college career, it looked inevitable that John Emery was going to be a pro. And then a couple of knee injuries later, and you think about what the, the future might hold for Emery. The first person I thought of when this happened, after I kind of got past the, the, the fog of, man, I, I can't believe this is happening, is Marcus Lattimore at South Carolina. Mm-hmm. And the way that he has been treated by South Carolina after what was going to be a guaranteed professional draft pick, a guaranteed featured back in the league, and a guaranteed 
multi-million dollar contract that that he was going to to have at least his rookie deal, right? I mean, he was going to be a first round pick, sign a big rookie deal after he got in the league. You can't really account for that, but that was definitely going to happen to him. I, I can't say with as much certainty as I would have with a guy like Lattimore coming out of South Carolina that, that, that John Emery would be a high-round draft pick. I can say with certainty, without the injuries, John Emery would have been a pro. That he would have gotten a chance in an NFL camp, and by seeing his skill set, I would have bet on him making a team somewhere with his ability to run, catch, just play, his skill set, what he brings. And... I know that you can't do this for everyone because there are a lot of players that come through LSU and get hurt. There's a lot of fan favorites that come through LSU and get hurt. But the way that John Emery has handled his six years at LSU, at times it was probably not textbook or what you really wanted the the, the, the program promoting. But all in all, from the, the, the totality of his time here, can't we all agree of his love, his representation of our state, of the state university, of the state football team has always been endearing, that you've always pulled for him, that you've always liked him, that you've always wanted to see him succeed, right? And again, I don't necessarily know if that means giving him a role in the athletic administration building, but I know the role that Kevin Falk serves as an ambassador to LSU, and I've walked around LSU's campus with Kevin Falk on a game day or a Friday before a big game, and, you know, you might as well be walking around with Joe Burrow. And I I believe that Emory, somewhere along the way, could really be some type of ambassador for LSU, LSU football, because of what he's given. And it's no more than anybody else that's come with him, you know, and been a peer or been a, a, a teammate. But when you just think about the outcome and what he means to the program, what he means to the school, what he means to the university, I I don't know. I I think that it it could possibly make sense because you just hate to see it end like this for him. I mean, it's just... It's the most John Emery thing ever. Yeah. Like where he goes out like you... But people were like, oh, John Emery's back on the team. You saw him flirt with the transfer portal. Then LSU makes an effort to bring him back. And you're like, you don't really expect or know what you're going to get from him. But we and me and Noah went out to the first practice. It's like they're running him a good bit. Like he was getting a good bit of run, and it turned into they're trying to get him better. Because like you said, you're not sure what you have. You know what Josh Williams brings to the table. It's up to Caleb Jackson to see if he can make that next that leap. And then John Emery entered the fold. And like, well, you know what you got in John a little bit. And to see him go out. In the first game of the year, when you need a running back, it's like John Emery comes in. You don't know what to expect. 10 for 61 and rips off a 40-yarder. It looks like he's going to score. And then two days later, torn ACL. It's like this is what happens to him all the time. Yeah. It's just a crazy, I guess, coincidence that this every time he does something good, something always comes up and bites him. And it is a question of, I guess, a little bit of how hard they brought him back. And he was clearly medically cleared, or else it wouldn't have been such a – it would have been a bigger story. But whenever you have an ACL in one knee, like the other half of the body has to give at some point. You're putting so much more strain on the other half. And that's what it seems like it was, is a non-contact injury at practice where it's the other ACL. So when you do kind of how injuries happen, when people come back, this falls right into that bucket of, all right, a lot of rehab, and he came back extremely fast, and then the other knee goes. I hate to hear it, man. I really do. It's It's just... You know, I haven't gotten over the initial feeling of of hearing it and knowing that that he'll have to sit and watch for the rest of the season. It's just um, I hate that for for John Emery and and, and like we said, I mean, we, we will get to the implications of what it means for the football team um, throughout the day. It's major, but it reminds me of uh, when Ali Broussard got mm-hmm. hurt in camp whenever he had the, I think it was a torn ACL. Yeah. And it just came across the newswire one day on like a Monday or Tuesday. And you're like, wait, because Broussard struggled with the same, like some injuries too. And he starts to, every time he kind of got it going again, you're like, oh, Ali Broussard, you can see the talent that was in there. And same thing with John Embry, where he's a five-star kid that came in number one running back in the country. 
And it's just you only saw glimpses. You never got to see him fully put together. But John Emery has probably one of the greatest highlight packages of just glimpses of the talent. And that's what made him so intoxicating was if he ever gets it all the way right. And even when he got hurt against Florida, that's a highlight. And then he goes down. But it's just it's so unfortunate, man, because you really thought if there was anything, if you thought that, you know, there's going to be a storybook at some point, like maybe this is how it ends for him. And. With that said, I don't know what his eligibility situation is, if he can apply for a hardship and come back, if he wants to battle through another Incredible. ACL. Incredible. Seventh year, yeah. John Incredible. Emery. Give me some. I will take him at a heartbeat. Give it to me. Give it to me. <laughs> I, mean, it's, I mean, it's got to be possible. Absolutely. I mean, in, in today's right. college football right. world, where you look up and there's a ninth-year tight end at Miami, yep. I mean, why not? looking at John Emery's situation, I could definitely say – he deserves that year that he missed where there was no medical. Right. There was no – I mean, he just that you just took the year away from him on some academic stuff. Now he's got his degree. Give him that year back. Yeah, it, like, or it would be like a, a medical hardship yeah. where he was a – he could redshirt like, essentially because he is missing – he hasn't played enough. It's the first game of the yeah, year. So right. where he could apply for a, a medical redshirt and essentially be granted another year. But – that's the other thing about Emery is I wouldn't be surprised if he did come back because the story is wild, and he had every opportunity to leave. Like, yeah. you saw yeah. him, like, flirt with the portal a little bit. That's fine. Like, you didn't, he didn't know if he was going to be welcome back. But even before that, when he could have gone to the league, he could have tested, like, people saw the talent. He could have tested the waters and tried to go play professionally, but he wanted to come back, and he wanted to get his degree, and he wanted to finish school, and he did. And you have the picture of, what, Frank Wilson, who, like, tweeted it out, him and his cap and gown, he's like, this one hits different. Because everybody kind of knew the story of John Emery and, like, his battle with academics. That was, like, the seemingly the one thing that was stopping him from playing the only thing that he really wanted to do was play football. And now that – I mean, you heard Brian Kelly say it was like, I mean, we got academics out the way. <laughs> like, now we can finally focus on ball. But you could see, like, the outpouring from not only the fan base, which I get, but it's, it's cool to see somebody so beloved in the program because he had every opportunity to leave. But the players – and the coaches, like everybody's kind of gutted a little bit. And it's just LSU season starting off with a little bit of a little rocky road here. I talked to two coaches yesterday and they were just floored, devastated. I mean, like they were, it's a death. Yeah. I mean, I mean really and truly. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a death in the family. I mean, it's, it's, that's the feeling of it where, you know, you lose somebody who's put in such hard work and there's just a, um, yeah, there's there, there's an overwhelming amount of support for Emory up there, which I know is going to help him in this situation. Um, but but the the early, you know, feeling and um, you know just crushing. It, Crushed. It sucks. Yeah, it's crushing. It's crushing. It's it sucks. But um, we we will talk about now what it means from a football standpoint. Remember, daily we're brought to you by Go Roof online at geauxroof dot com. Go Roof uh, overnight. A lot of rain. If you had any leaks pop up, if you got some problems with your roof, remember our boys over at Go Roof can help you today. Two two five nine two seven eighty three hundred. They'll get up on the roof in the rain, diagnose the problem, work with the insurance company. Ton of. Uh, experience in that field if you want to work with the best then go with go roof and nobody outside of the listening area here or, or, or service area if you're hearing this ad doesn't matter where you are i know that not everybody's in louisiana not everybody's in south louisiana not everybody's in baton rouge listening to our program if if you need a trusted quality roofer and you are not um, you're not pleased with 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 who you have or the the, the quality of work and in, in roofing uh in the in, in the, the the company that you're dealing with, call call Go Roof two two five nine two seven eighty three hundred or online at geaux roof dot com. All right, so you know you got Caleb Jackson, you know you got Josh Williams. Those two guys' workload is about to about to beef up. What else do you have there? All right, now all eyes turn and look to a rookie and a freshman in Caden Durham. And look, if if you've listened to this program over the last couple of years and especially over the last couple of months you know my feeling on force feeding freshmen I love a, a, a true freshman who comes in ready to play Ahmad bro played a ton of football the other night he, he, he to me was not force fed his reps it's obvious Don McKinley is not quite ready to go he didn't play right it tells me everything I need to know P.J. Woodland, to me, was force-fed 
out there because you're out of options. You don't know where else to go, where else to turn, who else to play. That's a true freshman, and you tell him, hey, man, we're just going to have to live and die with your freshman mistakes. We're just going to have to deal with the way you handle playing as an 18-year-old rookie in one of the toughest positions in football. Now, get out there and go prove us right. And for Caden Durham... It's obvious with the the emphasis that they were putting on John Emery and the persistence that they were working the back channels on the Trey Holly situation on finding out what's the deal legally, what's going to happen, that they need another running back. They wanted another running back. There were rumors that they were looking into the portal for running backs. Once the Holly situation fell through and it wasn't going to be legally determined on him being back to the start of the season, they called John Emery when he was in Los Angeles on UCLA's campus and was like, wrap it up. Get back down home. You're not going to UCLA. You're playing. But I'm, what's the, nope. Trey Holly thing didn't work out. You're playing for LSU. Hops a flight. Next thing you know, he's first team running back in fall camp. Play the first game of the season, he's the leading rusher, both in yardage and in carries. Obviously, they need another running back. They're they're, they're showing their hand. They're telling you, whether it's the the desperation of trying to find somebody in the summer to replace Holly or feeding John Emery in game one. So now where do you go from here? Caden Durham, as we said, rookie running back, comes out of a, a very successful a very prosperous high school program in Duncanville, which is located right there in the Metroplex in the Dallas area and pumps out prospects every single year. Caden Durham was one of their headliners last year. He was the number five running back in the country. He was a guy that Frank Wilson sought out and went and got. You rarely see Wilson extend his reach outside of Louisiana. Like Nick Saban said a couple of weeks ago, you can shake a tree and skill skill players are just going to dump out in Louisiana. He's speaking about defensive backs, wide receivers, and running backs. You ask any recruiter in the country, they believe that Louisiana, you can find those three positions by leaving whatever facility you're at. Southeasterns, LSUs, Louisiana Techs, ULs, Tulane, and go find one of those in a car. You don't have to get in a plane. You just drive over to a local high school and say, who's your DBs? Where are your running backs? Let me see your wide receivers. For the first time in a long time, Frank Wilson went outside of the state, sought after, and really kind of pinpointed one player that he wanted And that was Durham in last year's cycle. He knows that he had Harlem Berry coming up. He knows that he had JT Lindsay coming up. He knows that he had James Simon coming up in this recruiting cycle. And he wanted two of those guys. He's got Berry and Lindsay both committed to the class for 2025. 2024 only had one running back, Caden Durham. And for as much as I hate force-feeding freshmen and telling them that they have to play, Caden Durham, you got to play. And the next four weeks is a great opportunity to see if he's ready to play come October. Because when it gets to October, and not that LSU can, can, can really duck out and hide over the next couple of weeks, but you can definitely work on some things that you're not going to have the chance to do coming up here in about a month. And... Now, the top priority is getting Caden Durham ready to go. Or. I know Brian Kelly will meet with the media today. He'll be asked about Trey Holly. He'll be asked to update Trey Holly. And I, I assume that there will be some, some updates to, to hand over on Holly, whether it's dates, timelines, or something that he is anticipating on. Just some news coming out on Holly when they could get some type of of resolution, some type of, of answer to what's the deal. I mean, what's the timeline? When can you get him back? Because let it be known, if Holly's eligible tonight, he plays Saturday. And when I say plays, I mean like he touches the ball. 
I know that they've been keeping a keen eye on him, working him out, keeping him in shape, and making sure when he steps back in that for at least the physical shape of it, he's going to be ready to go. It's one thing not to be hit. It's one thing not to put on pads. It's one thing not to really go through the motions of being a, a football player every single day. But they're desperate at running back now with losing Emory and only having two guys that they what told me on Sunday night, they don't really trust. Like, they trust them enough to run them out there and see if they can bust one. But when it came down to it, Emory was the only guy in there. And that told me a lot. I mean, they were trying to run the ball, you know, by, by all accounts. And for the most part, Emory was the guy that was getting the carries. And now with him off the block, somebody's going to have to step up and Caden Durham's going to have to be it. You know, I mean, really, that's the, that's the only option you have at this point without really, you know, realistically looking at other positions and asking guys to do other things. I don't think they're there yet. I don't think that they're, you know, that desperate yet. But they're a play away from that. You know, I mean, that's, that's another thing that brings into this concern of the running back position is now you're 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 realistically a play away from having two guys the second week of September. I mean, you know, this is a long, grueling, winding season that you're going to have to navigate through and having to do that with two feature backs that are, you know, you're telling them they need to improve by the the reps that they got in in game 1. It's just not ideal. It's not ideal. You do have the opportunity to do maybe the coolest thing ever. Harold Perkins? You saw, yeah, you saw a glimpse of it. I mean, I, that's what I'm saying where you're not – I don't know if you're desperate enough yet to to bring some – I mean, you got to think about your defense. I mean, you know, here's the situation. I mean, like that that's the deal, right? I mean – these these storylines, I think, are fun to talk about, but when you have... It's one thing to talk about it with Stingley on the 2019 team, right? Where you've got... I mean, you've got some depth. Lose her... You know, you lose Harold Perkins on a tall sweep. Right. But I'm just saying, if you don't have... A, if you only have two scholarship running backs and it really gets down to it, I'm not even really joking. I wouldn't be surprised if he has some plays on offense. Like, I know that... I think it was like... Just uh, kind of a hat tip to get him the ball against Wisconsin. Be like, this will be fun, whatever. But if you're going to risk it, even in a in a meaningless bowl game, where God, if he'd have gotten hurt, then like that, you look like the dumbest coaching staff of all time. If you really do need a third running back, and you have somebody that talented, and the narrative continues to be, is, what are you really getting from him on defense? You want to see him be a playmaker? Go put him on offense. Yeah, no, I understand that, but I mean. You, your your whole scheme is, around, is I almost understand. built around him defensively. So, I mean, you can't rip him out of there. I, I would say that the more logical candidate for this, and it's something that we saw a little bit of the yeah. other night, was a little twist, was Xavion Thomas. He got a carry. Yeah. You know, they put him in, in some motion in, in a slot and brought him to the backfield and kind of caught him and gave him a handoff on his momentum moving downhill. And, look, I don't hate it. I don't. Uh, it's risky. I, and it's I, a I don't, risk. I don't. I don't dislike it. I also. I think he should probably get more. He should probably get more targets. He should probably be more of a focal point in the game. You know, going back and watching that game again. If Chris Hilton's not going to be, if he's somebody that you can't count on, and you're waiting for the younger guys to develop, Xavion Thomas has to be your deep threat. He has to be the guy that can stretch the field. I mean, I after watching, I'm just looking at game one. Unless there's another guy, I mean, you know, I mean, unless there's somebody else that can step up. If Shelton Sampson can do it, that'd be awesome. That'd be great. But, you know, I mean, realistically, Shelton Sampson hasn't logged a lot of reps, even in practice, to give you the peace of mind that that he can be that guy just yet. I, I would think that Xavion Thomas would be the next guy up as far as a playmaker that you're looking for. John Emery fit into the category of playmaker offensively. He was a guy that could change the scoreboard for you. 
He he could do it a multiple amount of ways, whether it was throwing the uh, you know throwing the ball to him or you know letting him run it. And I think Xavion Thomas kind of checks those boxes when you talk about somebody that could step in and give you similar skill set and keep up the production that you may looking for. I don't know if he can carry it ten times for sixty one yards versus USC. It certainly would look different. But it, it 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 seems like they trust him a little bit more than anybody else to be the next guy up, right? Like if it's not going to be Caden Durham that they look at and say, hey, we need you to play this Saturday and be ready for November or be ready for October, then Xavion Thomas feels like he's the guy that may get the reps that may have the 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 extended playing time come his way on this. We'll wait and see. Well, you have the... You can certainly be cre- more creative offensively and kind of hide the fact that you have two backs that you are going to be your bell cows when it comes to Josh Williams and Caleb Jackson. You obviously have to get Caleb Jackson going in some regard, but if you want to start running the ball a little bit more with Garrett Nussmeyer, if you want to start running a little bit more Aaron Anderson, like side to side where you can still get carries and kind of run a, an offense that looks a little different, but you can mask the fact that you don't have three guys that you can turn around and hand it off to. Yeah. It's it's a rare time at LSU not to have DBs and not to have running backs. <laughs> I mean, really. I mean, they, in the in the fifteen years that I've covered LSU intently, this is by far the the stringiest two year run, three year run of running backs and defensive backs that I can recall. I mean. You know, whether they just had a freshman that you didn't even know about, whether they had a guy that it was coming off of injury, whether they just had guys that they had in the system in the program that, you know, they were they were cycling through. You just rarely see them this desperate for for a guy at those positions like they are now. You know, I mean, I, I, you know, P.J. Woodland playing as a true freshman – those will be memories and, and instances and, and experiences that he can always draw back on and improve from. But ideally, you would like to have somebody out there where you don't have to put a, you know, a true freshman into that situation, into his first collegiate game, and ask him you know, to go guard the other team's best receiver. So, And I don't know if the running backs are as... I don't want to say bad, but if people are acting like Caleb Jackson and Josh Williams aren't that guy, like they, Josh Williams has played a good bit of football and he's been able to run it for you very consistently. Caleb Jackson could be a game breaker. Maybe that USC defense was just good, and that's I think a part of it. But also, you've never had to really you've never run the ball with your running backs in this offense, and since you've had Jaden Daniels, this hasn't been a focal point. So it's new for the entire football team. Yeah, no. You use Logan Diggs right now. Yeah. I mean, sure could. Really intrigued. Where's Trey Bradford? <laughs> Call him up. <laughs>